So last week we started 2 Thessalonians, right? This is possibly Paul's second letter. The first letter to the Thessalonian church would have been his, probably his first letter to a church. He had only spent three Sabbaths with the Thessalonians when he established the church, which means then at the most he spent five weeks before he was run out of town. This is a young church. Uh, this second letter is probably about a year after the first letter. So that's kind of the timeline we're in right now. Uh, again, a young church, but Paul crammed a lot into, into three to five weeks into this church. A whole bunch. Um, talk about eschatology. Talk about prophecy. That's one of the things we've been talking about. And so the first letter, he, there was nothing really wrong that was addressed other than uh, just a, a teaching that they had been taught, something that worried them that those who had passed away had missed the day of the Lord. And so we talked about the resurrection, and, and he talked about the resurrection, and we talked about the rapture and the rapture of the church and all that. Now here in the second Thessalonians, a year later, there's a whole other thing that's being taught. And evidently there are some counterfeit letters that have been sent uh, in the name of Paul and, and, and some other things that have been taught. They've been telling this church that Paul has been saying. And so Paul's going to address that in chapter 2 in the first part here concerning the day of the Lord. But in the first chapter, uh, he addressed the persecution that they were under. They were under extreme persecution, this young church. And he tells them. This is, this is the thing that it will bring judgment on people. And that God is right to judge people on, on your behalf when you're persecuted like this. And, and it explains the, the God's right to bring judgment. He is a righteous God. He's not just a loving God. We love the loving God part. Right? The one who's going to be gracious and merciful and bless us and, and do all for us. And people have taken that and, and they've just built it so up. they made God so lopsided. And, and the world definitely does not want anything but that. They, they don't want the judgment. They don't want the righteousness. They just want the loving, gracious, blessing God. But he's all of that. Equally all of it. There's nothing out of balance about God. All right. So... And Paul has, you know, told them again in, in the first chapter here that God is going to take vengeance on these things. And we look in Revelation, we see even the, the saints who lose their life during the tribulation time because of uh, being persecuted to death. That in heaven, they're in heaven crying out at the altar, Lord, how long? How much longer are you going to take before you bring vengeance, before you avenge our blood? And, and he's just like, you know what, just calm down, man, put on some white robes, take it easy, it's coming. You know, just take it easy. And uh, so anyways, we get to chapter 2. And, uh, and, and actually, let's, let's just back up to, to verse 11 here in chapter 1. It says, therefore, we also pray. And Paul's always praying for the churches. When you read through his epistles, he'll break out in a little prayer as he goes often. Or he'll break out in a, in a little worship time in his, in his uh, writings too. He says, therefore, we also, or we also pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power, that the name of the Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God in the Lord Jesus Christ. So he, he ends with, you know, there is a, a bad thing coming to those who persecute you. And what you're going through is horrible. What's coming to them is, is even worse. But listen, this, don't focus on the persecution. Focus on glorifying God. And in you, he'll be glorified. And in him, you'll be glorified. And, and he ends with some encouragement there. So now he's going to address the, the false teaching that's coming. He says, Now, brethren, concerning the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to, soon, not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, uh, as though the day of Christ had come. So there's the, there's the thing. Right? They're telling them the day of the Lord's already come. And this persecution is judgment time. This is, this is the tribulation time that, that Paul told you about. That's why you're going through all this, this tribulation. And that's what Paul is telling everybody. And that the day of the Lord has already come. And Paul's saying, listen, don't, don't be troubled by this. Don't be shaken by this. And uh, these things didn't come from us. This isn't what I've said. 
In fact, in a couple of verses, he's going to say, I told you about these things continually while I was with you. So Paul jams this teaching that he's going to have here in, in three weeks, three to five weeks with the Thessalonian church. All right, so, so don't be, don't be uh, concerning the, the, our gathering together to him. So that there's, the again, the gathering together of the believers, the church being brought up, being resurrected, being uh, um, taken out and, and, and brought to him. And when we looked at the other verses in 1 Thessalonians, it, it talks about meeting him in the air. And, and so his second coming is, is a, is a trying to think about how this was described. It, it is one event but with two different, it's one event with two different aspects, I think is how they put it. So you have, you have the, the beginning with the rapture of the church. He comes back, he grabs, he, he takes the church out. We meet him in the air. He doesn't come all the way back. The world is not going to see him at that time. We're going to hear him. They're probably going to hear. I mean, it talks about a great noise, a, a trumpet or, or the voice of an angel uh, when he calls the church out. In it could possibly be similar to Paul's conversion on the road to Damascus when uh, the people who were, care who were traveling with him didn't see what he saw, couldn't hear what he saw, but they heard a noise. They weren't blinded. They didn't hear the voice of God. They didn't hear Jesus' words actually being spoken. They just heard a noise. And so, I, you know, certainly when the, when the trumpet blows, when Jesus calls us, it could be like that for everybody on the face of the earth. I don't think it's going to necessarily be like we see in the movies where just everybody's just gone. Just quietly gone. No big event to it, really. Just We don't know where everybody went. They got beamed up. They're going to think we got beamed up for a reason. There's going to be a noise. It's going to be a major event when it happens. So Paul's going to just kind of mentioning that here, though he's not getting into it too much yet. So we're going to talk about that. We're talk about the gathering together. To him, anyways, not to sue me shaking, the day of the Lord hadn't come yet. Verse 3, let no one deceive you by any means. For that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. And the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? So, this is what has to happen first, right? And in the day of the Lord, the time of judgment and the time of tribulation, uh, the, the main sign for this is going to be the Antichrist coming on the scene. Now, you can say that's the main sign. That, that goes together with the the taking away of the church. I don't think, you know, the rapture is going to happen and then two seconds later, everybody's going to know who the Antichrist is. There's some other things that are going to happen too. There's going to be the attack from the north in Ezekiel 38 and 39. And when that happens, that's going to that's weaken Islam and Russia and all that world power. The great last world power and last world coalition really is going to be weakened to a point where one man is going to be able to come on the scene and say, let's make peace with Israel. I mean, of all nations in the world, why does the world need to make peace with Israel unless it's the result of that attack? Right? So when that happens, when God defends Israel, because God's going to defend Israel in that, it, it, it won't even be Israel so much. It'll be obvious to everybody. There is a supernatural defense of Israel in this. And, and we even see some of the foreshadowing of that now. We've heard some of the testimonies even now of when rockets are being launched into Israel and Hamas is complaining because their God is redirecting our rockets. You know, they aim for a city and it lands outside the city. Or even Israel saying, it was heading for us and all of a sudden it diverted. And, and so we see, you know, whether they understand it or not, even understand what the words that they're saying are. You know, that, that they are giving glory to God even without knowing it. But we see that all the time. We, we can even hear in our own politicians' words. And, and they're not good, but still, things that are, are prophetic. And we'll talk about that a little bit here, too. And not that I have any specific instances, but 
just the mentality of this world and the world's mindset right now is prophetic. It's fulfilling prophecy right now. And that is why it's so important to teach it to the church and even to new believers. New believers can handle this stuff. Because they just need to hear the words and trust that the Holy Spirit is going to teach them and give them understanding. And, and we need to do that with what, what we speak and what we teach. We need to trust that God's going to take that. The Holy Spirit is going to take that uh, to a person's heart and, and change their heart. Or give them the understanding. If you guys depend on me to make sure this is understandable, you're never going to learn anything. Right? If you get anything out of what I say, it's not me. It's, I'm not that great at this. Right, so, anyways, back to this. Let no one deceive you by any means, for the day will not come, the day of the Lord is not going to come, unless the falling away comes first. So what's the falling away? A lot of people point to the church, and it's the apostasy in the church, and that falling away means apostasy. It's the same thing. So we're talking about the, the apostasy in the church, and certainly that's happening. We are compromised beyond all kind of reason within the church, especially in America. There's so much that we that we have weakened on. Um, there was a, a survey uh, some years ago, and this was here's, I'm going to say this was in the early 2000s, and and they surveyed over 7,000 pastors, pastors, clergymen of five different. De denominations, the, the Methodists, the Episcopalians, uh, American Baptists, Presbyterians, and American Lutherans. Okay. And they asked him these questions, and, these, and, and this is the percentage of pastors in these, in these denominations that answered no to these questions. First question was, do you, do you accept Jesus' physical resurrection as fact? And this is the percentage of people who said no. In the Methodist church, the pastors, 51% said they did not believe that the resurrection of Jesus was a physical fact. Episcopalians was 35, American Baptist, 33%, uh, Presbyterians were 30%, and American Lutherans were 13%. Uh, do you believe that scripture is the inerrant word of God? In the Methodist church was 87% said no. The Episcopalian church, 95% said no. This is of 7,000 pastors. This isn't general congregation population. These are the people standing in the pulpits that said that they don't believe that the scripture is, God, is the inerrant word of God. American Baptists was 67%, Presbyterians were 82%, and American Lutherans was 77%. Do you believe in the virgin birth? And the Methodists were 60% said no. Episcopalians, 44% said no. American Baptists, 34%. Presbyterians, 49%. And American Lutherans, uh, 19%. Those are the pastors that don't believe in essentials of being saved that you have to have to be saved. They don't teach it. The seminaries don't teach it. Some of the Methodist seminaries in the 90s, and maybe before that, I found out about it in the 90s. We were already teaching that there was no second coming of Jesus. Right? So yeah, has apostasy happened here? Absolutely. We're ordaining all kinds of people who shouldn't be ordained. Church is, is fun and games. You know, it's coffee shops and bookstores. It, there, there is no hell. Right? Rob Bell, Mars Hill and Grand Rapids, it, was able to even stop being the pastor up there and go on a big book tour because he wrote the book Velvet Elvis and then he wrote another one called, I don't even remember what it was, but it talks about there's no hell. Doesn't believe that there's a hell. And, and we looked at that already, right? Last week. Verse 9 of chapter 1 is very clear. These things shall, uh, these shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Right? So, so we know there's a hell. We know there's judgment coming. And so the, the apostasy, apostasy is certainly in the church. We, we see all kinds from all kinds of denominations, even independent evangelical preachers and everybody else 
going to see the Pope and we're all going to be one big happy religion. And, and they, they'll have different religions. Right, so that's just the Christian leaders. The, we'll put that in quotes. Christian leaders. That doesn't include all of the other religious leaders like Buddhists and Hindus and everybody else that go to the Vatican from time to time and all worship together. It's coming, that, and, and that is also another thing that is foretold, that there's going to be one world religion. This man, this, this uh, son of perdition that Paul calls him, he's going to be the head of all that. He's going to have a second person there with him, the false prophet. We saw both of them in Revelation. You have Antichrist and the false prophet. The false prophet is his religious leader, the one that controls the religious part. He controls the economic and world power part. Until three and a half years when he sets himself up to be God that Paul talks about. All right, so I'm going to suggest so that the falling away, this great apostasy, the great falling away is even bigger than the church. It is the entire world system. It is against God. It's already setting up to be against God. Our own nation will embrace Islam and be against Christianity. It's not freedom of religion anymore. It is freedom to worship the way we tell you to. As long as you stay inside of your building. But don't bring it out here. No, you, you don't have any business coming out into the world, out in the public and sharing anymore. You don't have any business demanding that uh, your morals, your values, your Judeo-Christian values, the things that our constitution were based on, you don't have any, any, any business insisting that that be followed anymore. Right? We have all kinds of corruptness. We have, all, we have judges making laws. That's not their job. Right? It's not the Supreme Court's job to decide that same-sex marriage is okay and every state who has passed it in their constitution, it, well, it's just illegal now. It, all this stuff. We, we don't the whole world is just turned upside down. Right? They call good evil and evil good. And, and, and they have some backwards reasoning about the whole thing. And then, and then you have evolution. You want to get into science? You have evolution. If you don't believe in evolution, then you can't be a scientist. Not, not a, a, a good one, not a, a one that anyone should possibly listen to if you don't believe in evolution. But they can't really explain evolution. I mean, something happened and nothing and something happened and it got big and it spun around real fast and blew out into a whole bunch of different directions and the laws of physics don't really have anything to do with anything. And, and, and a fish gave birth to something that crawled out on the land and that gave birth to something else. But we don't really know where that came from. And if you really back them into a corner, they'll tell you that they believe that we were planted here by somebody else who's already gone through the evolutionary process. Well, I mean, you could say we were planted here, but not by somebody who's gone through the evolutionary process. And the church is so eager to be able to be united with, with science now that we have theistic evolution. We can still believe in God, but God just set things in motion and evolution happened. And it's not really six literal days of creation. It's millions and billions and ridiculous numbers of years. And at some point, God switched an ape into a man. And But that's a lot smarter than in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. So they have to have a lot of faith to believe what they believe. It's a religion. Whether they want to believe it or not, it's a religion. It fits the definition of religion. But the whole world is turning against God. The whole world is turning away from God. And, and that's not anything new. 
Man, you're just barely out. Well, you're in the garden, right? You're in the garden. Eve is deceived. Adam says, you know what? I'm going with her. He made a choice. He went ahead. He knew. He's the one held responsible for the fall of man. You get outside the garden. Two of their kids. One kills the other one because, well, because God didn't like my sacrifice, so I'm going to take you out because he liked yours. So the rebellion's there. We've seen the signs of it. The great falling away has got to come first. And the man of sin is revealed. So it's this big rebellion which grows and grows and grows. And it's, in, it's in the churches, out of the churches. All of mankind. And the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. Because if we just look at the world... In the sin, in the in the ridiculousness, and the craziness, and the the evil, and the wickedness, and, and that is foretold by Jesus Himself, right? As it was in the days of Noah. As it was in the days of Noah, that's how it's going to be at the coming of the Son of Man. And the description of Noah's time is that every thought of man was evil continually, and we see that. But the the, the rest of that description is they went about their business. They were Marrying and giving in marriage, or eating and drinking and having a good time. And I think that, that when Jesus said the coming of the Son of Man, at that point, when he used that description, he's talking about taking the church out. Because that's not the description of his second coming when he comes back all the way. When he touches down on the Mount of Olives, there's no marrying and giving in marriage and going about your daily business like nothing is ever wrong. They're gathered together in the valley of Armageddon, in, in, in Megiddo, there for Armageddon. They're waiting for him to come back. They're there to do battle. That's not everyday business. It's going to be every day when we leave. But that starts the clock ticking. The rapture fits into no man knows the day or the hour. We're to know the time, but we're not to know the day or the hour. We're to know the season. We're to be able to look at the Bible We'll be able to look at his word and know it's coming. We look at prophecies. We study prophecy. We know things are being set up. Things are, are, are moving in that direction. And we're to be ready. Just like a bride. Remember we talked about this a couple weeks ago when we talked about it at Passover time. Just like a bride is, is to be ready. She knows it's about time any day her groom can come for her. She goes to bed in her dress even. She doesn't even get undressed at night. She's got it all on. She's, you know, and she's waiting to hear. We're to be ready for that. That shouldn't take us by surprise. We're not, he told the Thessalonian church, we're not the children of the night. It shouldn't be the same kind of surprise for us that it is for everybody else. Surprise for us is like grandma and grandpa are here. We knew they were coming. They pulled in the driveway. Yes! That's, how the, that's the kind of surprise it should be for us. Right? We hear the horn. We hear the, we hear the trumpet. We hear the voice. We hear the noise. Yes! We're out of here. We see the dead in Christ rise first. You guys know I love to have a lot of fun with that, right? You know my mind how that works with that. I don't believe even that is going to be some secret thing that nobody sees. There's a reason why we've got this whole zombie apocalypse thing going on right now. There's going to be a lot of open graves. Not because they have to be open for them to come out. Because Jesus didn't have to have his open to come out. He had to have his open so we could go in. And, and honestly, I, if I'm here when that happens, I want to be doing a funeral when it happens. I want to be in the cemetery and see the guy get up. Because you know what's coming next. It's not taps. <laughs> and, and I think we have a foreshadowing of that in Matthew. I, I point to that all the time. That, that when Jesus came out of the grave, there were many other saints who had gone before that came out too and went into the city and showed themselves. And we don't know what else happened to them. I don't think it was like Lazarus for them. When Lazarus came out of the tomb, he was still bound up and walking around, and they had to let him loose. He had to die again. 
I don't think the ones that came out with Jesus at the same time, I don't think they had to die again. I think they left. I think like Enoch, they just were no more. Because we don't know anymore about it. I mean, you know, I'd like to shake Matthew a little bit and say, what do you, finish the story. You know, but, but that's okay. So the falling away, the, anyways, back to this. So the son of man, or the son of man, the son of sin, the man of sin, the son of perdition has to be revealed. So you have the falling away, the world system going this way, the son of perdition, the man of sin is revealed. And this is a pointing to the Antichrist. This is who we're looking at in Revelation and in Daniel chapter 9 and a couple other chapters in Daniel. This is him. He has to be revealed before the judgment comes. And Paul's saying, listen, you, you got some severe persecution going on. And, and he probably told them the kind of persecution that will happen to those who believe in the tribulation time. I think there's, I believe there's going to be believers in the persecution, or in the tribulation time. They'll get saved after we're all gone. I do believe that. But I mean, it says, there's going to be a lot of Jews who do. There's 144,000 at the very least Jews that get saved. You, have a, you said loose 144,000 evangelists in this world. It, there's bound to have, I think Revelation is, a, an innumerable number of people who come. Talk about a harvest. I mean, we hope for a revival and a harvest. One more before we go home. But that's going to be huge. And, and when Antichrist can't get to the Jews, he turns on the saints and, and he takes their heads off. And then we see him in, in Revelation at the altar. But this guy, he, he sets himself up as God. Son of perdition means destruction. The son of destruction. He's going to bring a lot of destruction, but he's also going to meet his own destruction. And at the end of that seven years, the lake of fire is opened up and he's gone. But he's going to bring destruction with him. He's going to fool many, many people. He's going to come on the scene when, when the world is just crazy, longing for somebody. Somebody who can set this right. You can already hear it now. People are already saying things like that. They look to our president to be able to set this country right. And if you think somebody can't just come on the scene, who knew who President Obama was five years before he was president? I had no idea who he was. I had no idea. He made a speech at the Democratic Convention four years before that. I had no idea who he was before that he made the speech. I never heard nothing about him after he made the speech. And all of a sudden, boop, there he is. It'll happen. It's going to happen. He's going to bring destruction. He's going to demand to be worshipped. We'll get to a point where there, you can't buy or sell unless you have his mark on you. And the technology is there for it to be automatic with all the, the RFID chips and the whatever else and the chips that they can implant and, and all that but I also think there's going to be a visible mark. Tattoos are so well accepted right now. Nobody's going to have a problem with sticking their right hand out there and put a mark out there to show my allegiance to him. It's not just going to be put the chip in so that you can have my money and have complete control and know where I'm at at all times. It's going to be show my allegiance. I really want to show my allegiance, put it on my forehead. It's going to be for real. This guy's coming. We call him Antichrist. It's instead of Christ is what it means. This is anything instead of God. Anybody instead of Jesus. The son of destruction. The one who motivates him the most. The one who will possess him at some point. What do we call him? 
That, that, isn't that not part of his, his characteristics that describe him? The one who seeks to steal, kill, and destroy? Verse 4 says he opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped. Everything. We're not worried about Allah anymore. We're not worried about Buddha. We're not worried about anybody else you can be worried about. It's all going to be focused on him. So that he sits as God in the temple of, of God, showing himself that he is God. Which tells us there's going to be another temple rebuilt. We know that. Right here, Paul says there, there's going to be a temple. He's going to sit in the temple of God. On that mountain that everybody wants to fight over. The Christians, the Muslims, the Jews, that's our spot. Nobody's happy that the other one is there. And we know now that the Temple Institute, they have everything. They have all the furniture, all the, all the things that they need to set up the temple. It's made. It's ready to go. They're training the priests. They have the red heifer to be able to dedicate the temple. They have all of it. I've even heard that they've already begun construction of uh, so they, like modules so they can take it up there and set it up. It'll be built so fast it's not even funny. I mean, we, we think it'll also take years and years for them to rebuild that, to, to build something like that and put it all together. It's not. It's going to go fast. Well, how can it? Well, read Nehemiah. Man, Nehemiah built a whole wall in, what, 52 days? Sword in a hand and a shovel in the other one, if I remember right, something like that. And they put that wall back together in short order. It won't be anything for God to enable these people to build a temple that quick. And this guy is going to make the pact with Israel, the seven-year treaty. Seven years of peace, and at three and a half years, he's going to break it. We'll see more of that when we get into Daniel. But three and a half years, he's going to break that treaty. And this is when he's going to set himself up to be God. And Paul says, <clears throat> Do you not remember that I, when I was with, uh, still with you, I told you these things? And now you know what is restraining that he may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of, of the lawless, of the, for the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. So the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. And we've seen it. I already talked about that. It's building, right? Lawlessness is building. Nobody wants to be told anything. Nobody wants to do or be told how to do, where to act, how to act. Nobody. We don't want laws. We don't want rules. We don't want to have anybody to be accountable to or an answer to. And, and everybody wrestles with that. You know, when I was 18, my dad suggested that I go into the military. I said, I'm not going to the military. I don't want somebody telling me what to do every minute of my day. I could say that at 18, right? Because now my dad can't tell me. He just looked at me and said, listen, it don't matter if you go in the military or not. Somebody's always going to tell you what to do. You're going to have a boss. You're going to have a wife. <laughs> you have somebody telling you what to do all the time. So what did I do a couple years later? Join the military. I always say, man, my dad, between the ages of 18 and 25, became the smartest man in the world. Honestly, I believe a word he said before that. At 18, didn't believe anything. Just because you said it didn't work for you doesn't mean it won't work for me. It came right out of my mouth. By the time I was 25, I'm like, Dad, what do I do? What do I do? Lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. As bad as it is, 
as horrific as it is, and we could, we could come up with all kinds of unbelievable atrocities that are happening. Things that they don't even put in horror movies that are, that are happening to people all over this world at the hands of their governments and, and leaders, at the hands of their neighbors, at the hands of their family members. All kinds of things. And evil is being restrained. It's being restrained. So this guy can't be revealed, though, until the restraining force is taken out. Well, we know the only one who's really going to be able to restrain evil is the Holy Spirit, right? And I don't think the Holy Spirit is taken from the earth. Obviously not, because you're going to have people who are saved during the tribulation time. But his restraining force taken away. He's going to let it loose. The restraining force, and what he uses to restrain evil now, even still, I think, is the Holy Spirit working through the church. Through those who are willing to stand up and say, you can't do this. It at least makes them pause to argue before they can act. I think this is another slight point to the rapture of the church being taken out of the way. But when that restraining force is taken out, verse 8, and then the lawless one will be revealed. And then. So listen, believer, you're not going to know who the Antichrist is. Don't listen to people who think they know. Stop chasing it around. If you don't need to know, quit looking for the Antichrist and look for Jesus. Right? And they say, when we see these things begin to happen, look up. In Luke 21, look up. Your redemption draws near. He's coming. Quit looking for the Antichrist. It drives me nuts. It doesn't drive me so nuts when somebody who believes in a post-tribulation rapture or a mid-tribulation rapture looks for the guy. What drives me nuts is guys who are pre-trib that look for who he is. Why? You don't believe you're going to know him anyways. Who cares? And, and you can pick the, the worst dude on the face of the earth right now, and he's going to be worse than him. He may not even have a realization yet of who he is. And again, you just point to our president and how fast he came on the scene. And it's not a big deal for God to bring a new world leader on the scene that fast. The last two popes we've had, who knew him before they get, became pope? Most of us probably don't even know the guy's name right now. I don't know. I can't remember. But really, the, these guys, the guy resigns or the guy dies, and the next one, in a couple of weeks, pope. And we have to have a whole history on his life because we don't know who he is or where he came from. And I, and I get, we're not Catholic, so we don't pay a whole lot of attention to it anyways. But still, the whole world does. Catholic or not, everybody watches to see who's going to be the next pope. Right? It's not going to be any different for a world leader. He'll come on that fast. The lost one will be revealed whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. Now there have been times, and I actually found somebody by accident this week who, who teaches that the Great Tribulation was back, it happened in 70 AD, and that a lot of revelation was already been fulfilled. I'm like, No. And actually, the reason I even looked at this guy was because he was debunking something else that I was looking at to see if I needed to be aware of and debunk. So I thought, hey, he's on the same side. No, he's not. I don't like him either. I mean, he's probably right about this other guy, but you're wrong. Your reasoning for him being wrong is wrong. But anyways, that's the crazy circle that I make myself in during the week. Antiochus Epiphanes was not the Antichrist. Foreshadowing of. 
Caligula was not the Antichrist. He wanted to be, made a statue of himself, was sent into t- to Israel to be, have it put in the temple. And I believe it got lost at sea. One time, Hitler was not the Antichrist. Probably could have been. Wasn't time. Hey, Jesus said John the Baptist would have fulfilled the prophecy of Elijah coming had Israel received their Messiah because he came in the same spirit as, as Elijah. I happen to think it's going to actually be Elijah and Moses, the two witnesses in Israel going to drive people crazy for three and a half years. So crazy that when they die, when they can finally kill him, it's going to be like the new Christmas. Celebrating for three days, giving each other gifts and presents, all kinds of stuff. And then they're going to get up again. And then everybody's going to watch him ascend into heaven. this guy, as bad as he is, as powerful as he is, as much control as he's going to have over the entire earth, the fact that he will set himself up to be worshipped above everything else. And just with his breath, Jesus is going to destroy him. Just with a word. Think about that, Armageddon. The whole valley giant, huge valley filled with blood to the horse's bridle. Not because the armies of the Lord that have come with him, not because we go out and fight, not because the angels go out and fight, but because he just says so. He just, with a word, with his own voice, the the sword that comes from his mouth, all of those people dead. Paul wants them to know, listen, even if this guy comes on the scene in your lifetime, the God you serve, Jesus himself, he doesn't compare. Satan, the Antichrist, not the equal opposite of God. Just opposite. Not even close to equal. Not even close. That's what Paul wants them to know. Don't. Don't fear. In the face of your persecution, no fear. Trust in Jesus. Verse 9, the coming of the lawless one is is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders. So this guy's going to be able to do fake miracles. And I don't think he'll have to fake them. I think it'll it'll be real. Things will happen. He's going to look like a god. And with all unrighteous deception among those who perish. See, we have a realization of righteousness. And sometimes it, it tears us up because if we can see Jesus unright or Jesus' righteousness and we can and we can comprehend that, at least to a degree, we know then the unrighteousness in our own hearts, and we have to deal with that. And his righteousness has to take the unrighteousness out of us. And we're going through this process while we're here, this sanctification, this being set apart, and we're dealing with that. But he's coming with unrighteous deception. And it'll justify their unrighteousness to the point that they think they're righteous. That they think they're right. Because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. See, they've got it wrong and they don't understand. And, and, and their, their leaders that, that want to debate and want to tell them and want to teach them and show them and, and, and tell them how they should argue with Christians and how they should debate with Christians, the big thing is how can a loving God condemn anybody? You've got to take them back to John chapter 3. He's not condemning them. He came to save them from the condemnation they're already under. The world
world is already condemned. The loving truth is that Jesus died on the cross for your sins so that you don't have to go to hell. You don't have to be in eternal judgment forever. Well, I don't believe a loving God would do that. You don't believe a loving God would do what? Die for you? Take your place? How much more love does he need to show you? No, no, it's not that. I don't believe he would need to because I don't believe a loving God would judge me. But he will. He is the judge. And, and, and he wants you to be in front of one of his seats, not the great white throne judgment. He wants you to be at the Bema seat judgment. That's where he wants you. And he is going to judge. Do you stay in condemnation? Do you pay the price for your sin? Or do you accept my payment for your sin? And they can't grasp it. And they can't wrap their head around it. They either don't think they have any need for a Savior or they just can't get it. They, they can't be good enough on their own for God to let them in. We know that God would want everybody to be saved. He paid the price for everybody. Everybody. The whole world. You know, there are those that teach the limited atonement. Right? He, he only paid the price for those who are going to be saved. And he paid the price for everybody. That's why there's still condemnation if they don't take it. And the Bible says he paid it for everyone. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie. That they will, or that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So they're going to make a choice, and, and at some point, our choice, God solidifies. In as much as if you give your heart to the Lord, he protects that. He, he, he helps you to come through. You, you're saved. You are saved. You have salvation. You're saved. And I believe he makes that sure. If you don't, at some point, just like Pharaoh, you harden your heart, you harden your heart, God hardens your heart. He honors your decision. That's what I'm trying to say. God will honor your decision to follow him or to reject him. He will not force himself on you. He won't make you get saved. He will honor your choice. And listen, your last chance doesn't, from our perspective, from my perspective, as long as you're breathing, you, you have a chance. Because I, I, I don't know. But from God's perspective, just because you haven't taken your last breath doesn't mean you haven't had your last chance. Pharaoh had his heart hardened by God. God honored his decision before he died. It appears here that it will be the same. God will send them the strong delusion to believe a lie. What lie? Whatever lie. I mean, really. The, the, the world is shaped up to that already. Zombie apocalypse, UFOs, you know, whatever. Whatever lie you want to tell them, they're going to believe. They'd rather believe a lie than the truth. Evolution, whatever. They would rather believe a lie than the truth. They would rather believe a lie than the loving truth.
and they'll all be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. And sometimes it comes down to that. Listen, we, we still know this. If we're honest as Christians, we know this. That there are moments when we embrace pleasure over honoring God. We still struggle with our lusts. We still struggle with our desires. And, and we will do something or indulge in something that we just shouldn't. And we know we shouldn't. And we do it anyway. And, in, and if we're believers, man, it makes us crazy. We're so, we're disappointed in ourselves. We're just, Lord, I don't know what I'm doing. You got to help me. I got to be stronger than that. You got to, you know, we go back. We ask for forgiveness. We know he's waiting for us. We know he didn't just dump us off because we blew it one time. But they decide to live in pleasure of unrighteousness rather than accept the truth. They live in it. A lot of people out there, some will even just boldly say, I'm a carnal Christian. I believe in God. I believe in Jesus. I believe in all that stuff. But I don't believe he demands that I give up anything. Well, then you're not reading the whole Bible. I can still live with my boyfriend. I can still live with my girlfriend. We don't really have to be married. God's okay with it. He told me so. I can divorce my wife and marry this other woman. He can't. That's not in God. Didn't tell you that. It's contrary to His Word. He has not put that in your heart. That's your own desire for unrighteousness winning out. What you think is going to bring you pleasure, and you're not willing to put that moment of pleasure, that time of pleasure, that season of pleasure. For an eternity with God, what is wrong with us? How do we get there? Then you have our three three letter favorite word here, but we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God from the beginning chose you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. As crazy as this world is, as broken hearted hopefully as we are for them and we want to take the gospel out. We want to preach the gospel to all creatures. We want to make disciples. We want to fulfill the Great Commission. We want to do that as much as we're broken for them. We still at the end of the night can lay our head down and say, I belong to Jesus. A little prayer as a kid. At night we used to say, at least I used to say, now I lay me down to sleep, I pray the Lord my soul to keep. And if I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. It should just be, I know my soul you're going to take. I have to pray, please Lord, take my soul if I die. No, <laughs> no. It was wrong. It was cute. I know what I meant. But now as an adult, I'm looking at that, I'm going, no, that was, no. She should have just said, I'm coming home. If I die in my sleep, awesome. I'll see you when I get there. You know, something like that. Why, why do we got to do this cute little nursery rhyme prayer? If I die in my sleep, I wake up in heaven. If I die while I'm walking down the street, I wake up in heaven. If I fall off this stage and die, I wake up in heaven. You guys got a mess to clean up. I wake up in heaven. Right? Encouragement. Paul, Paul, Paul is not the great condemner. Paul is the great encourager. If you go back in Acts and read when he left the church at Ephesus and everybody came out and it even says even the kids came out to see Paul and to see him off. That tells me Paul spent time with the kids. The kids love Paul. And listen, Paul could go on and on. It's almost noon and I'm still going. And you might get a little nervous in the last couple of weeks. I've been a lot longer than I normally have been. But hey, Paul, man, went so long a dude fell out of the window and died. And before he could keep going, and then Paul went, raised him up and went back. 
Right? All night. The guy can work all day, preach all night. Think about that before you complain about me sometime. <laughs> Bound to give thanks to God always for you. Brethren, beloved in the, by the Lord God. Beloved by the Lord because God from the beginning chose you for salvation. And you know, I just, I, I cannot be on one side of predestination and free will. They work together. The Bible teaches both. Quit fighting over it and just deal with it. Right? If you're saved, he chose you before the foundation of the world, he told the Ephesian church. Before in the beginning, God created. They already had the plan worked out. They already knew what Adam was going to do. They already knew what I was going to do. And they said, we'll take it. Right? Paul told the Roman church, whom he foreknew, he also predestined. If you've got to have a better explanation than Romans chapter 8, then just take it up with Jesus when you get there. That's all I can tell you. Have some faith, and, and it's all right. And Paul's like, we're just thankful that you, he chose you. He chose you for salvation through sanctification, this process that we're going through. We're being saved. Our salvation is being worked out. And Paul tells one of the churches, I don't remember which one it's in now, but to, to work out your salvation in fear and trembling. It's going through the sanctification process. It, it's being set apart. It, it's, it's letting him take parts of your life that you never thought you would have to give up. It, it's letting him move you in a direction you never thought you would move. You, know? and you guys... You're looking at a kid who would take a failing grade in high school before I give a speech. And now you just pray that I'm done by noon. Right? By the Spirit and the belief in the truth. The work of the Holy Spirit and your belief. God's sovereignty, your free will. Together. Work them together. To which he called you by our gospel for the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. God called you. We were faithful. We went out. We preached the gospel. You believed. God, God is setting you apart. He's working in you. All for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because I was obedient, God gets the glory. Because you believe, God gets the glory. Therefore, brethren, stand fast. Stand fast. How many times in the Paul's letters have we seen him say to the church, stand, dig in, don't move, don't give up any ground. Don't. You do not have to compromise your faith in Jesus Christ for the sake of getting along with somebody. For the sake of accepting. You don't have to accept the world. You don't have to accept their traditions. Hold fast. Stand fast. Hold to the traditions that were taught you. The things that were taught you. The essentials of the truth. The obedience of Christ. The, the, the virgin birth. The second coming. The resurrection. Hold on to all of it. and Don't let anybody tell you any different. Paul wasn't talking about stained glass windows and pipe organs. They're beautiful. And if we had an opportunity to have a building like that, I would jump on it in a heartbeat because I love old church buildings. It would freak out everybody else in Calvary Chapel, but that's okay. That's the, the other end of legalism. If you tell me I can't have a steeple and a bell tower, I want one. Lord, I want one. I want one that works. I'm going to ring the bell, let everybody know the gospel's getting preached right now. Come on. But that's not what he's talking about. Hold fast to the traditions. Hold fast to the things we taught you. Hang on to those. Don't let anybody move you. 
whether by word or by epistle. So whether, whether your teaching came because I stood there in front of you and I spoke it to you, or whether it's because it's my letter, my handwriting, or at least his signature because his eyes were bothering him so bad that he couldn't even write. He had to have somebody write for him. When we get these, these strong words from Paul, we think of a man who's big, got a big voice, intimidating, not afraid of anybody. Church tradition tells us that Paul is a squeaky voice, bent over old man, eyes leaking and weeping because of a disease that he contracted in his travels. He, he wasn't the image that we have from the words. Hold fast to those things that you were taught, whether by word or by epistle. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and our God and Father who has loved us and given us everlasting consolation and good hope by grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. And he's not even done yet. Don't get discouraged by what you see. Don't get discouraged by what you hear. Somebody tells you Jesus has already come. He hasn't come. Somebody tells you we're living in the great tribulation. Read Revelation. Pretty obviously we're not. Somebody tells you there's not going to be a rapture. He's not coming to take his church. Don't believe it. Somebody tells you the church needs to be judged. No. Not the real church. Not the real church. And listen, you're the church. This building, not a church, obviously. Big, great, big, huge stone buildings with tail belt, not the church. The most beautiful woodwork and stained glass windows, not the church. You're the church. Your heart is the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. The Holy of Holies. You want to know Jesus? You need to talk to the Holy, to, to, to God. You don't have to go to a priest. You don't have to have him take a sacrifice in for you you don't have to do anything you get on your knees cry out right now driving down the car or driving down the road cry out wherever whenever we can with great confidence when it says we can boldly go before the throne of god it doesn't mean we can go throw a fit and demand it means with great confidence we can go before our god and our savior and we can ask anything we can go and we can say dad I think I need this. We can even go and say, Dad, I probably don't need this, but I really want it. What do you think? He might tell you no. I can deal with that. He might tell you yes. If he tells you yes, then you better ask that second question. All right, now how do I use this to honor you? Right? Listen, with great boldness, with great confidence, we can go before our Father. Don't be moved. Don't be moved out of your place. Don't go with a popular opinion. If it doesn't line up with the word of God, don't go with it. Well, how do I know if it lines up with the word of God? Glad you asked. Open up your Bible. And please, have a Bible. Not an app. You lose them. They go away. Your phone dies. You know, if you want to be a conspiracy theorist, one of those electronic or electromagnetic bombs goes off and it's all gone. Right? Power goes out for weeks. Can't recharge. I can still read my Bible. I just have to read my Bible. You can't. You're freaking out, having withdrawals from Facebook. I can't. The power's got to come back on. Right? Listen, have this and know it. Know it. Study it. Verse by verse. Chapter by chapter. Go through it. Read it. It takes 72 hours for an average person to read, or average reader, to read through the entire Bible. 72 hours. They have an MP3 set that proves it. 73 hours. 72 hours. Which, you know, how many times can you read in a year? Then, get a one year Bible. You should be able to read through a one year Bible in more than a year, or less than a year. 
All right. I'm just pushing you. Comfort your hearts. Establish you, or, or may God comfort your hearts and establish you in every good work and word. All right. Establish you. May he give you people and places to talk to and to be an example to everybody. Don't think you have to bring your friends to church to hear God's word. You know it so you can spit it out there. You know it so you can minister to people. Let's pray. Ron, let's do something different because I know the song we got. Get the kids out. Let's bring the kids out for the last song too. I'm going to pray while they're coming out. Let's stand up. Everybody stand up. We talked about a lot of kind of downer stuff, but we talked about a lot of good stuff. Be encouraged. Be encouraged by the whole thing. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for your word, for raising up a man like Paul who would show us by his life that there was no need to fear man. That is much more important, much bigger to fear God rather than man. Because if we fear you, Lord, if we respect you, if we follow you, then what can man do to us? So, Lord, I pray that we would take all this to heart. That as we see the wickedness and the evil in our world, that it would not cause us to look for the son of perdition, but it would cause us to look for the son of glory. can't wait for you to come. Lord, I pray you come quick. Because I want to see your face. In Jesus' name, amen.